Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Now, we're here at uh, Kudutir in Valais, which is an excellent shooting range. Anyone uh, visiting here who shoots should probably come and pay it to visit. Now, uh, what we've decided to do today is compare, from a user's perspective, the old Swiss Model 1882 revolver, which was updated in the late 20s by Adolf Führer to the Model 1882-29 revolver. Now, uh, from a manufacturing perspective, there's quite a few changes. We're not going to go into them in this video because there's quite a lot. We'll do it at a different time. Now, uh, basically, the idea was cost saving. It was costing, at, at the end of the 20s, 115 francs to make a Model 1882, and Adolf Führer managed to get that down to 85, which for a non-officer rear echelon guy who needed a gun but didn't need a rifle, that's a good cost saving. I think he did a good job there. And he managed to do it without incorporating a toggle lock. <laughs> that's a difficult uh, bit. Yeah. Adolf Führer is an interesting character because uh, he was um, head of the Federal Arms Factory for a while and he was a toggle lock obsessive. Now, toggle lock wise, they had the MG11, which is basically a Maxim MG08 but Swissified. They had the Parabellum pistols, and he also did some work on them, reducing them uh, in price from, if I remember correctly, 185 to 150 francs a pop. If I got it wrong, I'll put a correction down the bottom. Um, and he invented, developed the MG25 machine gun, which is a fascinatingly over-engineered light machine gun with a nasty floppy bipod. <laughs> Magazine on the right-hand side, recoil operated with a toggle lock. Of course. Basically, uh, more or less a Luger mechanism turned on its side and in a full barrel shroud. It's uh, they're fascinating bits of kit, and maybe one day we'll be able to show one. Hopefully, uh, he also did a submachine gun like this, and he also did anti-aircraft artillery and big artillery. Can you remember toggle, what the big toggle locks? I can't remember what the, the designation the, is. There's some fairly large toggle locking artillery he developed. He liked his toggle locks. Now, um, people often claim just as a thing, that these are uh, Parabellum barrels, Luger barrels. They're not. They're a very similar profile, but they're not the same length. They're not the same barrels at all. They're not cut down, uh, shortened Luger barrels. Anyway, um, there's a few ergonomic changes that went on. The, the, the fundamental revolver is the same. And if we just have a brief look at it, it's, a, it's an Aberdeen system with a loading gate on the side. This, uh, when it's open, it blocks the hammer, or if you've, you're silly enough to have cocked it first, it blocks the trigger. And it means that when the hammer is down, you can rotate the cylinder to load. The gate loaders, which was fine tech for the 1880s. Uh, by the Second World War, they were extremely long in the tooth. Yeah. And uh, in a video I did for TFB TV, I described this as, as probably the last gate loading revolver. Um, but by that point, they were really dog handlers and uh, military policemen and yeah. train guards. Yeah, anyone who needed some form of self-defense but uh, didn't need to carry a rifle. Uh, a lot of the 8229s went unissued because they were they were built from the mid from about 1933 onwards. Uh, both types of revolver were actually still on issue into the 60s or possibly even 70s. Dog handlers and people like that, um, but. A lot of them were only shoot because they they needed less of them once paratroopers became a thing because that pushed further back the number of people who were at risk of coming into contact with with a well armed opponent. So a lot of people that previously had revolvers got rifles instead. So this one is un un P marked, unprivatized because it was it was never issued. I got it out of the factory, it had been proof fired and that's it. That's it. Not uncommon at all. No. Now um, these replaced the 1878 revolver, which is a gateless gate loader, not an Aberdeen. It can't be an Aberdeen system if it doesn't have a gate. <laughs> we will at some point have one of them to show, but not today. This particular one belongs to the chap. Mine here, which is already featured in a bloke on the range video, has the later wood grips. And about halfway through World War One, they uh, stopped doing these hard rubber grips and replaced them with wood, presumably from material shortages and one of the myths 
mentioned this once before, is that this was an officer's model with black grips and a non-officer's model, which is just, it's just a sheer coincidence that they stopped issuing these to freshly minted officers um, at about the same time that the changeover occurred. It's a, it's a sheer coincidence. Anyone, anyone being issued one of these, whether they were uh, an officer or not beforehand, got black grips and just by, by that point the Parabellum pistol had penetrated the system enough that even rear echelon officers were being issued Parabellums instead of revolvers. Now, the main changes are, from a user's perspective, they're ergonomic. Slightly tautological, but there you go. Um, the first thing that's interesting is that the sights have changed. These are a, a, a bead front sight, a new notch, and it's gone over to a to a tapered post. Um, it improves the sighting, uh, the sight picture. So mm -hmm. we'll see if that so has yeah. any effect. And the other big one is the grips. These are quite skinny, and in fact, the the, the plastic ones are slightly skinnier than the wood ones. Mm -hmm. And they went over to a um, plastic, so a rectangular. Yeah, it's bigger, it's yeah. it's chunkier, it's it's um, serration, serrations on the back. Yep. And, uh, and front. <laughs> the other issue is more internal, that um, the lock work is not as finely finished. There were changes made in the lock work, and again we'll go to this in an, at another occasion where we'll have them both apart next to each other. Um, that does have an impact on the trigger pull. We shall. Uh, we shall see whether that really has an impact on the target or not. But we'll be shooting the chaps one with black plastic grips and not mine, because mine had Bubba's attention, who uh, attempted to square off the front sight to make it more suitable for target shooting. Um, he clearly had more astigmatism than me because it really wasn't straight and I had to finish the job. And in terms of shooting this in competition, I'm extremely happy with that modification there. But in terms of a uh, historical Comparison. Comparison, it is incorrect, so unfortunately mine goes on the side and we'll be playing with these two. Now, as for ammunition, one thing we like to bang on about on Bloke on the Range is that you can shoot 32 Smith & Wesson long with these. Uh, not good if you want to reload them because they tend to blow out a bit. But what I have here is not a box of Fiocchi 7.5. It was a box of Fiocchi 7.5 and it did cost 105 francs over a hundred dollars for 50 shots however uh, a friend had acquired this he doesn't reload and he gave me the cases so I'm, I'm on a very much on an original bullet weight original velocity roll for as much as possible certainly with handguns so uh, I designed a bullet by modifying an existing design from accurate molds so uh, if you're into casting accurate molds are excellent and there'll be a link in the description below go buy their stuff I'll put the indication of which mold this is. It is uh, 108 grains. I have powder coated it in uh, two different colours. That won't make any difference. We don't really care. Um, if, sure. if you like blue ones, I didn't do any pink this time. <laughs> they're all, they're either red or blue. Um, sized to 314 with a Lee push-through sizer and loaded over 2.2 grains of accurate number two, which replicates the original load. And it's a little point. I do all my load development for these revolvers in this. These have much uh, much chunkier cylinders. So if by some chance one of your test load, your, your first test load is a bit on the spicy side, there's no risk. These have surprisingly thin chamber walls, and uh, one thing that's interesting is that the the cylinder stop notches are halfway down, and um, this can be absolutely. Wafer thin. <laughs> In fact, no, wafer thin, thin is far too large. Paper thin. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, so, what I did was I took this one and chronographed some original ammunition, which is black powder, uh, in it, and then I velocity matched the same bullet weight, but lead rather than FMJ, um, and worked up a load with nitro, fast nitro powder. Uh, to approximate, well, actually to get to the same velocity, which gives us roughly the same pressure. It'll probably the initial is probably a little little higher, but uh, these tiny charges of, uh, 
of nitro powder, they don't they don't produce massive pressure spikes. There's just not enough energy there. It's not enough resistance. Plus, it, it's lead. It's not very hard. It's BHN10 for those that cast. So only twice as hard as uh, a soft lead. But in any case, much 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 softer than anything jacketed. So, just like back in the day last year or whenever it was when we did 455 Friday and 380 Friday. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're both going to do a bit of leisurely shooting. Um, doctrinally, it seems to have been training mostly at 50 meters, mostly slow fire, single action. That's not particularly practical. Um, we're going to put the target out at all of 10 meters because that's more practical, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and it's early in the morning. And it's, yeah, yeah we've traveled a long way to get here <laughs> and I haven't had enough coffee yet. So, uh, we're going to fire a cylinder or two each uh, through each revolver. We're just going to put the one, the, the one target up, and uh, grouping-wise, there won't be much in it. Possibly a couple of single action, mostly double action, because it's more practical, and see if the ergonomic changes really make a difference. Parat. Doing double action, yeah? Yeah, mostly. Mostly. See how it points? Come up quickly and take a shot quickly. Yeah. Whisper. Okay. Yeah, one flew off, God knows where. Oh, you lost one? Yeah. Huh. I can see why though, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Alright, um, well we know where they are. Two shots. Okay. Ooh, you're flinching that. <laughs> oh dear. Um, only two hits. Yeah, that was one. Ooh. And that one. Huh. She's odd. Well, that sucked. Right. Shall I see if I can do a little better? I'm sure you will. Oh, in case anyone's wondering about pressure, this, even with this fast powder, there's a serious amount of unburnt powder kicking around the place. So uh, these are extremely low pressure. Ugh. Make sure they're in properly. Six on that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. <laughs> that points very differently. Yep. Yeah. Well, 
they're all on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Well done. So, shall we uh, have a discussion about what went right and wrong there then? Let's. Okay, I'll let you start. Right. Um, first of all, I'm not quite up to scratch through the right-handed shooting. <laughs> That's made it clear. But um, it went not quite as I expected. Um, I shot high with the 82, and I think that's because the sights, um, when I was doing the quick quick point, this for some reason was always high. They all sighted at 50 meters though? Yeah. But Because I took my first two shots with that very, very carefully, mm. despite the awful double action, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, but I, I, I took careful aim here, and they were still up there a bit, and that's only 10 meters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was difficult to get the sights right. I um, found I found the sights with that weren't too bad. Um, I was expecting worse, but then I'm I'm normally I'm a I'm a target shooter, but bringing them up, finding finding that bead, putting it in the U notch, I didn't find that too bad to be honest. That was that was a lot easier than I expected. It points this one points quite well. Oh yeah. Um, I mean not it's not doesn't point like a, a like an Enfield number two points, but it points pretty well. Um, the double action, you can tell doctrinally double action wasn't a real thing uh, back in the day. People didn't believe double action was really any good benefit, of yeah. any benefit until at least the First World War, but the, the Continentals were kind of stuck in, stuck in their ways. There were no um, uh, Ed McGivens or any of, any of the other people in the First and Second World War era who um, Fairburn, uh, Fairburn and Sykes knife fame. Um, the, on, there were no continental equivalents. Plus, this was a Remf gun. It's a Remf bang stick. Yeah. Um, the grip, yeah, point, grip, yeah, it's fine. It, point, it, point, it points quite well. The sights are okay. No one's loading these in a hurry, by the <laughs> way. Um, we have a massive advantage with the modern ammo with nitro because it's not dip lubed in wax. Yeah. I mean, no one was reloading these in a hurry because you couldn't. I mean, having loaded the original ammo, you have to push it in quite hard because you've got a massive blob of wax on the end of every one. Yeah, also the trigger feels comfortable to pull, um, even though it's horrible. Single action is going great. Mm. But, uh, not in this uh, context. Uh, mine is better. I want to say that because it's mine, but mine was clearly someone's target gun back in the day because my single action is better and lighter uh, and that we didn't shoot, I didn't shoot any single action there but I've um, played with this one single action and uh, and whatever they did, whatever polishing they did also positively influenced the, 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 the double action which is also another reason why it wouldn't have been fair to have used mine um, for this test. Anything else about that one before we move on to no, I think so. this? Abomination. Can I say anything positive about this? For me, the sights were you more friendly, I found. Yeah. Didn't show up on target, but it felt friendly. <laughs> um, the sights are smaller. I found them harder to pick up, but the big issue for me was that when I say pick up the sights, I mean literally pick up the sights. So yeah, you don't really notice it, but the grip angle on these is actually quite different. They look about the same, but they're not. This actually up the top, it slopes a bit more, and it actually points quite nicely. This, they fattened up the top of the grip, and it's fatter. In, th in theory, you'd expect this to fit your hand better and shoot better, but it doesn't fit naturally anywhere in your hand at no. all. There's no, there's no natural point where I feel, ooh, but if you think on a, on a Smith & Wesson or a Webley or practically any non-continental revolver, you've got a natural point. This one, you've got you've got that sort of um, elbow, well, shoulder there. Mm. It actually sits quite nicely in your hand in the right place. And when you bring it up, the sights are about there. This one, when you bring it up, it's pointing down. It's like, like almost like a gasser <laughs> for straightness or a, yeah. or, or a yeah. Nagant for yeah. straightness. But there's no sort of that way, there's no sort of that, but it doesn't really quite feel right, and in any case you're pointing down. Mm. Um, they're just not comfortable anyway, but 
this, they're not particularly aggressive to, to feel, but in the hand, they, they bite, I find. Yeah, I just... This was not an improvement. Uh, the sights you think are an improvement, for target shooting, they seem to be an improvement, but for quick shooting, they're a little bit finer. Mm. In fact, I found for, for quick shooting, the, uh, the bigger notch and the, and the, and the bead was, was quicker. I mean, we're talking minutes of man at ah! range, <laughs> yeah. uh, not, not politely uh, doing some feet to target shooting like we normally do. Um, trigger. Yeah. Nah. Not an improvement. It's it's bigger. It's it's yeah. it's clunky. This this turns smoothly. It's heavy, mm. but the cylinder turns smoothly. You can pull it. You can pull it through um, smoothly, ish. This is just. It's, You're fighting a lot of a lot of internal yeah, friction stick, in there. Stick slip. It, it, it yeah. sticks slip all, all the way around. Even trying to pull it through fast mm. while not going, um, you, you feel it stick slipping. It's uh, uh. so from a user perspective, not an improvement. No, overall no. Any other points? Nope, I think so. Okay, so um, on another occasion, we'll take these apart and show you what uh, Furrer did in the absence of toggle locks uh, to the inside and uh, but that's it for today thank you very much for uh, for watching please like and subscribe um, thank you very much to Kutier in Sion in Switzerland for the use of their awesome range and uh, please consider supporting us on Patreon if you haven't already done so it really does help us to take days off work and come down here and turn an awful lot of money into noise this yeah. one not so much other things we're shooting later yes oh yeah lots and lots of noise so See you again. Thanks. Bye. Bye.